So, in the second part of uh, the, this presentation, we will be looking at evaluation of experimental de design data. Uh, we'll do this by looking at an application on ca uh, dynamic binding capacity optimization on capital S. Uh, in the first part, uh, and uh, what's the uh, focus of today's uh, talk, we'll be looking at an evaluation of a full factorial design data on this, on this uh, capital S optimization. So the details on the actual application note are available in, in, uh, on the web. It deals with uh, how dynamic binding capacity for a particular uh, protein depended on the load pH and the load conductivity when running capital S. And in the application note, uh, you'll see that what was employed was a central composite phase-centered design. The actual raw data is available in the application note as well, if you'd like to plug this into your DUE software of choice. So the uh, anatomy of the CCF design, the central composite phase centered, looks like this. We have a, a four experiments, a four experiment uh, factorial part. Those would be the purple corners of this design in pH and conductivity. We have three red center points at the middle and we have the four green star points that add the ability to detect second degree curvature. In this first part of our evaluation, we will only be looking at the full factorial part. So we'll imagine that we didn't run a, a central composite phase centered, but instead that we ran a full factorial. And we'll see how that evaluation would work out. So the model that this experimental design would support is the linear model with an interaction effect. So the full polynomial would be, uh, as written, uh, written here, uh, dynamic binding capacity would be expressed as a constant term, plus some coefficient times a linear effect from pH, uh, plus a linear coefficient times the conductivity, plus a coefficient uh, times pH times conductivity for the interaction and finally plus the error term for the model prediction error. So that's the polynomial that we can fit to this data. So that's exactly what we'll be doing, but before we go into the, the DOE modeling and uh, transfer functions and statistics and everything, we'll just uh, look at a replicate plot of the raw data. Looking at your raw data is often, I mean, it's, uh, it's often a very good idea before diving too deep into statistics and number crunching. What we see here, what we look for primarily is uh, some key features. We look at the variation in our replicated center points, which is what you have on the farthest to the right uh, part of this graph. You'll see three points sitting together at around 120, 130, 40 in dynamic binding capacity. Uh, so we'll look at for how much variation does the center point seem to have versus the overall variation. So the corner points and all the star points and so on. In this instance we see that while the center points have some variation, but overall we have much more variation across the different corners and the star points. So whatever effect we have uh, have had from pH and conductivity is probably a real one that we'll be able to understand and model. If we compare with, with the alternative scenario for the center points where those three center points would have been very wide apart, then already at this stage, looking at the raw data, we would uh, be, be probably well advised to conclude that we shouldn't pay too much attention to statistics coming out of this, of this data set. Because if we cannot replicate our process, so if the center points replicated have larger variation than all the corner points, well, we're not going to understand how we got the results we got in a corner point. We'll also quickly see in, in plots like these if we have some very suspicious outliers or one can, e one can even see if there seems to be a second degree curvature. So second deg degree curvature, we can actually see some indication already here because the center points are among the highest values that we have. So remember that if the center points fitted nicely to a linear, linear model, then we did not have uh, a second degree curvature. 
In this case, the center points already in the raw data are among the highest, so could be that we have a plateau that then tapers off and we, we maybe will be needing a, a quadratic model to describe this. We'll see when we start going into the evaluation. What we first do is to fit the polynomial that we can fit, so the maximum complexity that the experimental design supports, in this case linear interaction. And we'll see how well it fits. Uh, I should mention that all the cartoon, all the, all the evaluation graphs that, that we use here are, are from the uh, Unicorn 6 software that's, uh, ca that comes with Actavant. It's uh, the DUE software that is embedded is Mode from Geometrix. Uh, and, and the typical evaluation graphs that are, are used and presented here are common to very many DUE softwares. So what we see here on the summary of fit graph is first off the R2 bar. That's the standard R2 regression statistics that tells us how much of the variation in our response, the binding capacity, can the, can the polynomial fit to? How well can we fit our model to the data we have? So the model can describe around 75% or so in terms of R2, which is not, it's not very extremely high, but it's not very bad either. However, the Q square bar, the second one, the blue one, is negative which is a, a, it's, not a good, it's not a good sign. Uh, Q-square has to do with the predictive ability of a DOE model, and it's essentially an R2 value calculated by cross-validation. So instead of, like when we calculate an R2, we, we have all the experimental results available for the polynomial. When the polynomial is fitted, when we calculate the Q-square, what is done is that uh, experiments are excluded one by one or in groups a couple of times. Uh, excluded, then the model is fitted to the remaining experimental points. And the model that was fitted to these remaining points is then used to predict this excluded experiment. And that procedure, and the, the prediction error for the prediction is recorded and the procedure is repeated until all experimental runs have been excluded exactly once. So that gives us a predictive R2. In some softwares it's called R2 predicted. In, uh, in Unicorn mode it's called Q-square. So a negative Q-square indicates that this model is not going to be, the model we have is not useful for prediction. The third bar, uh, almost invisible here, is yellow and, and highlights the model validity. Model validity in the, in the software uh, uh, compares the residual variation, so the, the magnitude of the prediction errors, to the replicate variation across the center points. And what the very low yellow bar is telling us is that the prediction error is, is much, much larger than the replicate variation over the center points, which of course is an indication that the model is not valid. Fourth bar compares reproducibility of the center points to the overall variability. And as we saw in the replicate raw data plot, uh, the variation was very low uh, uh, over those center points compared to the corner points, meaning we have great reproducibility for this experiment. So we'll now look in a little bit more detail on, on the regression as a whole and on whether or not the model has a statistical lack of fit. Uh, this connects back to, to the yellow bar on the summary of fit and also to the R2 value on the summary of fit. This, this check is made by the ANOVA table, which is a somewhat abstract uh, tool within DE, but still a, a, a very classic and very powerful one to tell us if we have a statistically valid regression model and also whether or not we have a statistically significant lack of fit in our residuals. The first part of the ANOVA table that we'll be looking at is this middle part where the regression, uh, amount of variation captured by the regression is compared to the amount of variation still left in the residuals. If we look on the variance column here, you'll see that we have around 3,000 units of variation captured by the regression, around 1,000 units captured uh, or still remaining in the residuals, meaning the regression is only three times as big. So we take the ratio between these two, 
the, the, the regression is only three times as big as the residuals. And this translates, this F value here, translates into a, prob a probability of only 0.20 or as much as 0.20. So it's a 20% chance that the regression number here, 3000, is not different from the residual variation at a 1000 level. So this red p-value of 0.2 tells us that, in fact, even though the, P, the R2 value was 0.75, that R2 value is not significant, not statistically significant. It could be there's a 20% chance we got this model just by random chance and there is no systematic uh, ability to describe the process in our current polynomial. So that's the first part of the ANOVA table. The second part is the lack of fit part, where the where the reproducibility across the center points is compared to the residual variation of, of, on the overall model. So again, we would like, uh, in, in this scenario, we would like them to be approximately the same size. We would not like them to be wildly different, right? With, in the upper part, we want more variation, much more variation to be in the regression than in the residuals. In the lack of fit part, we ideally would like the prediction error to be around the same order of magnitude or same size as the, re the pre repeatability of the process. And again, we get a red p-value here. We get a huge, uh, a very strongly significant difference between these two numbers, the, the lack of fit uh, in, the in the residuals and the reproducibility across the center points. So this red p-value here tells us that it's a statistically significant lack of fit. This model is not really working too well. So we'll continue now to try to understand why doesn't the model work too, too well. We know that we have too much variation in the residuals because we, both in the first part of the ANOVA, the regression is not big enough compared to the residuals. In the second part of the ANOVA, we saw that the residuals are much too big compared to the reproducibility of the center points. So our current model is not doing a very good job. And the next step now would be to, to look at the residual variation in more detail and try to identify what's the reason for this. So when looking at the residuals, we have a number of, of highly useful tools to do that. Uh, we'll look at, at uh, three of them now. The first one will be a normal probability plot of the residuals. Ideally, we would like, uh, or it should be that if we have described or captured all the truth, cause and effect uh, in, in our process, what remains should be random noise, only random variation that in most cases also become normally distributed. So a simple test to graphically see if we seem to have normal probability variation on our residuals. We'll also look at the residuals versus run order and residual versus individual x variables. So for this particular model with our four corner points and three center points, the residual plot of the prediction errors, the normal probability plot of the prediction errors looks like this. You'll see that all corner points have negative residuals, all center points have positive residuals, and they form two groups more or less. Uh, ideally, we would like the normal probability plot to describe a nice, uh, more or less straight line in order for the residuals to be normally distributed. So we can see here that something is definitely not random in our prediction errors. We are consequently predicting the center points on one side and the corner points on the other side. The scale on the y-axis of this uh, graph is, is not linear, as you can see if you look carefully on the, on, on the, on the scale there. It's actually a, a, normal, a normally distributed scale which uh, looks like this then. So if, if uh, normally distributed data comes into this graph due to how this scale uh, is, uh, is scaled, uh, the data would form a, no a straight line here. Pretty, pretty smart way of, of constructing this graph. Made in days before computers, still valid even today. So we know it's it's not uh, so we know it's it's not random in the residuals. So 
it could be that we get that non non-random uh, prediction error because we have a time shift. Uh, something happens over time with our sample, with with our with our feed, or with something with our uh, ambient temperature or whatever. So a classical or very important thing to look for is also time trends. Do we have a uh, a trend or not when we look at the residuals in binding capacity versus run order here. And now with seven points we cannot expect uh, a, a huge amount of, of solid evidence, but definitely this does not seem to be a trend up or down versus time. It seems that versus run order the residuals uh, are more or less uh, uh, indifferent to the run order. So how about if we graph the residual versus one of the x's? And now something interesting happens. Now you'll see that, so what's the graph? The graph is the residuals here on the y-axis versus the load pH on the x-axis. So at the low pH we'll have two experiments performed. That's actually two points here, even though it not, doesn't show perhaps at the two different conductivities. And then it's two again here. And then we have the three center points at the middle. And here you can see, clearly, I, I've added the, the, yellow, the, red, uh, uh, the red curve, but uh, that's to exemplify or highlight even more that there is, in, in effect, a, a quadratic uh, shift here, a quadratic behavior, a, a curvature remaining in the residuals. So our linear model is not doing a good job, linear with interaction, is not doing a good job describing this process because there is a curvature uh, behavior uh, on how binding capacity is affected by uh, pH and conductivity. So now one, one could be tempted to conclude that of course since this is so clear in this graph uh, it has to be the pH that, that causes the curvature. However, however if we now flip to, to the graph of residual versus conductivity it looks exactly the same. So, and this is an important point as well in terms of looking at factorial and fractional factorial DUEs, is that we can detect curvature. So we can clearly see that we have a curvature uh, that remains in this case in the residuals, and we need to expand the DUE to, to better understand that. But we cannot say which input parameter, which process X, is causing the curvature. It could be load pH, it could be load conductivity, or it could be both of them. So to summarize, uh, what, what we got so far from this is that we see that we have great reproducibility across our center points and the, the corner point results therefore that deviate from the center points should be uh, possible to explain in terms of how pH and conductivity affect the binding capacity. However, the current model with the linear and interaction uh, complexity doesn't work too well. It has a significant lack of fit with, with too much variation remaining in the residuals. We know the residuals aren't, they aren't normally distributed. They aren't uh, systematically changing over time but they have a strong curvature versus the input parameters. So to be able to better understand and quantify how the binding capacity is affected by pH and, and conductivity, the next step will be to expand this experimental design into a central composite phase-centered design or any, any RSM design that enables us to quantify and understand this second degree curvature and hopefully be able to quantify more completely the combined effect on binding capacity. So that's all that we had for this second part of the talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening in today and uh, I'll be back soon again with the final part of, of understanding design of experiments. Thank you so much. <laughs>